Maybe I can hold it. Welcome to uh, The Couch. This is our new Mosaic slash Apita Task Force branded um, vlog. Um, my name is Chris Yang. I'm the director of the Mosaic Cross Cultural Center um, and current chair of the Apita Task Force. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and we're joined by our staff um, here for this inaugural episode um, where we're just going to, you know, talk about the things we normally talk about on the couches. Um, so let me pass this off to uh, Sharon to introduce herself. Hey, y'all. I'm Sharon Singh. I'm the program coordinator of Mosaic, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'll kick it off to Pearl. Hi, I'm Pearl. Um, I work for the PETA task force. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Yeah. Oh, and I pass it to Jess. Hey everyone, I'm Jazz. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a social media and liaison at Mosaic. And pass it off to Kenny Beats. What's up? It's Kenny. Uh, you say them pronouns. I am the cult a cultural programmer at the Mosaic Cross Culture Center. The yeah. cultural programmer. <laughs> <laughs> the. <laughs> um, and I will be passing it over to the one and only Erica. Hello, everyone. My name is Erica. <laughs> um, I use she, her pronouns. I am the graphic designer at Mosaic. <laughs> I almost forgot what position I held. Sorry. Um, and yeah, I don't... Has everyone introduced themselves? Yeah, yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, so just a, just a quick intro, since this is our first episode, uh, theoretically. Um, you know, we... At the Mosaic Cross Cultural Center, which is a student uh, resource center and identity based resource center, um, kind of um, at the uh, San Jose State campus. Well, we don't have a specific identity we support. Um, we support a variety of identities. But anyway, um, we uh, uh, like a lot of resource centers you'll find in institutions of higher education in this country. Um, we have some couches for folks to sit at. Um, there are these green couches, green and brown couches that, um, you know, have seen a lot and been through a lot. Um, and uh, usually when we're open, um, which we're not currently because of COVID, um, you know, we'll have students of all sorts who will stop by um, and they're part of our greater Mosaic community. Um, they're people that we see on the regular. Uh, and they'll come by and, and they'll just kind of tell us what's going on with their lives. And, you know, sometimes me or Sharon or any of our other staff folk um, will spend time on the couches and like interact with each other. Um, we'll eat lunch there, you know, that kind of stuff. And what we have found is that some of our most um, interesting conversations happen on those couches. And, you know, we've been now in um, shelter in place uh, since March. It is now September, so we've we've been at this for like six months, um, with really no no end in sight. Um, we don't really know when we'll be done with shelter in place. Um, and one of the things that's been super important and super um, needed during this time is community. Um, and so, you know, part of our community was being on those couches together. So, you know, we thought it would be a good idea for us to try to start up a video podcast to, to um, replicate um, that feeling of being on the couch and just talking about what's going on in our lives, talking about what's going on in the world and seeing where those conversations take us. Um, so we are here um, to record this, it is Tuesday, September 8th today. During the recording, this will probably be released way later than that because it takes a minute to edit things. Um, and we're hoping to also invite some SJSU students who want to be part of it, right? So mm -hmm. oftentimes they'll be sitting around eating lunch or working or whatever, and then someone will be like, damn, this happened in class or this is happening 
in the world and we'll end up talking about what happened and then we'll somehow we'll end up talking about how capitalism sucks. So, you know, that's going to be the overall theme of <laughs> um, some way, shape or form. Um, yeah. But we're hoping if you're interested in being part of, you know, this video podcast, let us know. Mm -hmm. And then definitely interact with us in the comments um, and let us know what your thoughts are and about probably all the things that we're going to cover, which are going mm -hmm. to be very random somehow, but they'll make sense to us. Maybe. Yes. Yes. I mean, they'll, they'll make sense. They'll make some sort of sense. Um, so, so one of the reasons that we are, are talking about this right now and that I brought up the date is because, you know, we just had another blistering hot weekend here in California, um, in the Bay Area specifically, here in San Jose. Um, I, I think a lot of you are situated in other places, but for us in San Jose, it was really hot this weekend. And um, in the state of California, we're still, we still continue to have wildfires going off. And, you know, we had been, uh, spoiler, the six of us had, had been talking before this. Um, and the topic of the wildfires came up. And, you know, um, uh, just just uh, how much is going on with that and how affected our lives have been with the wildfires. Um, so, you know, we have been talking about how, like, at least, so my opinion, you know, on the wildfires is that this is a solvable problem. And the the reason why it's not getting solved is because we lack labor and we lack resources and both of these things can be provided for um one in the form of money and one in the other in the form of uh uh robotics and mechanics um through um like our like state local billionaires like you know we're in the heart of the silicon valley here in san jose we have millionaires if not billionaires you know within a 90 mile radius of where we are um, you know, these people who are CEOs, who founded companies, who work for places like Facebook, Apple, uh, Yahoo, uh, you know, Zoom, and Zoom is right in our backyard. <laughs> Zoom's here. Um, you know, and we, we are, you know, a huge distribution um, center for Amazon, that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, and you know, it would not be that difficult to form a coalition of millionaires, billionaires, whatever, to, to put money together into a pot and, for example, spend that money to build firefighting drones, you know, and have an army of drones whose sole job it would be to, would be to fly into wildfires and lay down fire suppressants. Um, this is a solvable problem. I don't know why we're not solving this problem. I, I mean, I, I don't know why they're not solving this problem. That sounds scary, like, all these, like, different drones just flying over and just, like, spraying water on everybody. Um, that reminds me of, like, chemtrails or something. Whatever that was. <laughs> what? Chemtrails? What is that? That, like, uh, conspiracy like, the airplanes fly over and they, like, drop chemicals in the air, like. It's in the same family as, like, anti-vaxxers who believe that, like, we're being poisoned by this is when Kenny comes out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like, you know, you look up in the sky, you see a plane, and then there's just smoke coming from behind. You're like, kind of confused. Is that yeah. what it is? It's not, but that's what people think it is. That's what people not. think it is. <laughs> that's not what that is. <laughs> oh, okay. But to me, okay, uh, since we, we had been talking about wildfires, you know, we could pass, move on. Um, speaking of anti-vaxxers too, I was, I was just reflecting with um, some family members this weekend um, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, hopefully by the end of this whole thing, we will have a vaccine for COVID that will, will provide some sort of biological protection from this disease that's, that's kind of shut down our world. Um, and at, at that point in time, whether that's, you know, three months from now, nine months from now, a year and a half from now, whatever, there will still be some 30% of this country that will refuse to take that vaccine. Apparently, apparently there's already one that's supposedly going to be available, but like, honestly, 
I don't trust it. Like, it's not even on some anti-vaxxer shit. It's just like, I don't trust that. It's too fast right. for a vaccine. Like, don't, 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 don't do the alpha launch. Like, yeah. let, that, let that get field tested a little bit first. Yeah. Maybe phase four. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's wild to me that, like, there are going to be millions of people in this country who, based off of anti, anti-vaccination bullshit, will just not take a COVID vaccine. But they're just going to hurt themselves at that point, right? Like, who else can they hurt? Not me with my Fine. That's their lesson to learn. <laughs> yeah, that's on them. And they're- right, but then for me, it's more so that adults are making choices for kids, right? And I think that's where I'm like, you know, it, I understand from a person's point of view of like, I personally don't like drugs. Like I, I feel, you know, um, some type of way of putting something into my body that I don't know how it's going to react, right? Everybody, everybody reacts differently to drugs of whatever. Um, so I understand that you're making a choice for yourself, but then it's what gets me the most is most anti-vaxxers have a very strong stance against vaccinating their children. And that's what I'm just like, yeah, so, like the basic vaccinations that people need. <laughs> right. And like, do you really want, we don't, like polio came back. What? Yeah, that's the thing. We have a chance to end some of these diseases and yet they come back because people don't get the vaccinations. Right. And, and we know that there are certain things that affect kids differently. And there are, they don't, they don't know. They're, you know, and I think as an adult, we have to realize that, you know, like, I just, you know, the whole argument that, like, autism is one of the causes, I'm like, first of all, that's not true. We clearly know that now, but, like, you choose not to read. Um, But the second thing is, like, you would rather have your child be sick and, and maybe possibly die than, like, have a kid that has autism. That shows more on, like, you know, how we see disability in Mm. our in our country than anything else and that's where i'm like you gotta work on some stuff (laughs) although although also not to downplay the effects of autism yeah i mean it it can be very there there are there are people who are inflicted with very serious debilitating like autism where where they can't function day to day having said that that has nothing to do with vaccinations right exactly and we know that like the person who wrote that article, I don't remember his name, but the person who wrote the article saying that vaccinations are one of the, the causes for autism has said that, oh, that was a lie. Yeah, mm-hmm. and somebody else say like, oh, it gives babies dementia. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> what? They're like making up all these different excuses. I'm like, all right. Yeah. But wait for the the, like the do we have mandatory vaccinations right like that everyone has to take or are they just not? You mean for for schools or for like when you you know how like you get your shots like when you're a baby or whatever? I don't know. Oh, just to just to live in the United States, they're not mandatory; they're recommended. Hmm. Interesting. But for schools, we have to get like measles or something, right? Like yes. So yeah, for, for, for most public colleges and universities, you are required to have an immunization record or some medical excuse why you can't have an immunization record in order to enroll. Someone was talking about that, um, about like, because, you know, like this whole like new COVID vaccine that's supposed to be available in November. People are like worried that they might like require that for schools. But it's like super, again, not on some anti-vaxxer shit, but, like, that's just so concerning, because, like, it, it's just, I feel like it's just a super rushed process for, like, a COVID vaccine. Yeah, because, oh, yeah, the whole time they were saying, like, by the end of the year, by the end of the year, and now they're saying, like, November. I mean, I guess it's technically the end of the year, but that's not the end of the year enough for me. <laughs> and it's not the end of COVID either, like, 
Hmm. A lot of people are thinking that COVID is going to be over once the clock strikes 12 and it's 2021, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think we've seen too that colleges, as a generalization, not to be specific, but as a generalization, colleges have, have been trying to rush through COVID as much as possible. And they're trying to, at any point, go back to a new normal of like, no, no, we can still have on-campus housing. No, we can still have football. No, we can still have whatever. Yeah, wasn't there recently um, two or three colleges in the in the East Coast that have had to re like, you know, like close down because they had um, opened up, and now like in like the first week, like a hundred something students got COVID. Mm-hmm. That, that's happened to a lot of colleges. Yeah. There was another college that I heard about, like, there are students that they, like, violated the social distancing regulations, and then they said, oh, you can't come back, and we're keeping your tuition. And, like, this mm-hmm. school year barely started. Mm-hmm. So, I'm like, you're putting people on campus where, obviously, there's going to be some violations, and now mm-hmm. you're going to take their money. That's yeah, that happened. was, I think that was... I want to say either Atlanta or maybe oh, North one of the Carolinas or something. Northeastern University. Oh, Northeastern maybe. I don't remember. But yeah, I definitely remember that story. Um, Why keep tuition though? They basically, they basically did, I think, I think this is, I didn't read it deeply enough, um, but I think what they basically did was just expel them. So like, you know, uh, when you get expelled, you don't, you don't get a refund. Mm-hmm. Like, I think Chico recently, like Chico State, like they recently had like a COVID outbreak because of like, um, yeah, I forgot, I forgot why. But like now the, the university is like kicking students out of like housing and stuff and mm-hmm. practically leaving them like houseless. Ugh. And I don't know like the full details, but like, I don't know, universities are like not handling this well. We got an email. Like, all the groups got an email from Nancy um, saying that, like, you all have to get tested. It's, like, a county order because I guess some San Jose Greeks have been throwing parties in their house. So, like, there was, like, a date on it, but the date was, like, the next day. And I was, and then I emailed, and I was, like, how are we supposed to get this done in a day? And I haven't even been in San Jose. So then I guess they, like, amended it so that, like, only if you've been living in a house in San Jose, you have to get tested by the state. But I don't know if everybody did. That was like super random. Mm. I do. I do think that that one of the trends for university COVID outbreaks, it's either been football related or it's been like fraternity related. Those seem to be the two big trends. Men. <laughs> Toxic masculinity strikes again. <laughs> okay, I let me revise my earlier thing. It's capitalism and men. <laughs> which, which which go hand in hand, really? Definitely men. I feel like we have. I have like I have been involved in a lot of those conversations personally. Carl has, and, and if you follow the trail of Mosaic and Apita podcast and video cast, <laughs> you, will, you will get to watch and hear every time that Carl feels like uh, men let her down. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I know we were talking about like how um, how like universities want to like return to this like normal this normalcy or whatever but like Mm -hmm. they're also just trying to like make living with like covid normal when Mm -hmm. it's like not normal right but like it kind of just reminds me of how like professors right i mean i'm only gonna start with professors right now they've just been like okay i don't know if it's just me but like i feel like some of my professors have been like hella like i feel like if this were like in an in-class thing like no COVID like we wouldn't be going this hard like there's like assignments like hell assignments due every week and every like I don't even know how and like today I know like I posted this on my snap but I was just like in one of my classes 
in one of my classes, my professor was like, oh, like, um, he was, he was like, he be, he opened by talking about like the scholar strike. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, oh, like, um, I don't know what he was saying about it, but then he's like, oh, like, I know some of y'all like work two jobs and like have all these like units you're taking and like personal responsibilities or whatever, but like, I'm sorry, like you have to dedicate like so-and-so hours to this class. And it was like a lot of hours. I was like, chill, like, mm -hmm. chill. I don't know. It was just like, he spent like half the class talking about it. And I was just like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I, I do I do feel like there are some faculty members for classes that that are kind of overcompensating. Yeah, which also I don't understand because I'm like, you know, you're also going through this pandemic too, right? Like you have you're putting work on yourself and and you have to go through these situations too, unless like they're not. I don't know, like they're I. I don't know. Like, I just don't, I, it's not computing for me. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't expect that from professors this semester, because, like, I thought they would have gone through training, because, like, of all the stress that they put on students last semester, but I guess they're still on that same stuff. It sucks. I, 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 um, they did, a lot of professors did go through a training thing over the summer, at least for San Jose State. Um, which I think helped in some things. However, you know, I also think systemically, like we in higher ed are very like, for better or for worse, we don't really like telling faculty members what they can or can't do. So it's kind of like, you know, like Erica was saying, like this faculty member clearly was like, was told or was reminded at some point, like, hey, your students might have two jobs. And so the, in their brain, they're like, oh, even if they have two jobs, they still owe me X number of hours or, a week. Oh, okay. You're telling me, so I have to acknowledge it. But like, right. these are still my expectations. Right. No, that's not why someone reminded you. Someone on Twitter, I feel like a long ass time ago, they're like, professors be like, oh, I know we're going through a rough time. All right. That's enough, like, accommodation for today. <laughs> Like, they're just like, oh, I, I acknowledge this, but, like, they don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I, like, I don't even know why, like, late penalties are, like, a thing right now. Or, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, some, of my, some of my professors have been, like, very, like, you know, like, I have, I have these deadlines, but, like, you don't have to turn it in until, like, you know, like, the end of the, like, the, the year. But, like, it's pretty much, like, she's not going to, like, give you a late penalty. They're like, they're just like these like very strongly recommended deadlines, just so like, you know, your work will pile up. But like, I appreciated that because I was like, okay, cool. Like, I like, I like that. Mm -hmm. I had a professor that was like, oh, it's okay if you're like a few days late, but if you're like a couple weeks late, I'm gonna reach out to you and ask what's wrong. Or I have some that like, just don't turn it in at the last week. So I'm stressed, like trying to like grade your stuff. So I'm like, okay. But see, that's, at least it's, like, an acknowledgement, like, I'm going to talk to you and, like, check in, as opposed to, like, F. Right. <laughs> I'm going to kick you out of my class. Right. Like, I think that's even, you know, being mindful that everyone is in a different space. And, you know, not everyone has access to technology, you know, like, or Wi-Fi, even if someone has a laptop, like I have seen so many posts because a lot of schools, even, um, you know, K to 12 have opened up in the last two weeks. And I'm seeing like, you know, kids outside of fast food chains trying to like get Wi-Fi. I'm seeing um, students like sitting around at the park trying to get like Wi-Fi from different houses around the park. And I'm just like, we can't expect a student to complete like a homework sheet or a project, you know, when like access is an issue, right? And and a lot of students um, and their families have lost jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's either that $50 goes to internet or $50 goes to buying food. If anyone watching this podcast is in LA, I just found out that uh, the county libraries are giving out 
why uh laptops and hotspots so just wanted to put that out there mm -hmm. yeah and and there are programs and resources that are doing that so um including san jose state's own san jose state carers program but you know i, I do i do think that like you know one of the major things that's coming out of this is that we really need to rethink pedagogy entirely like how do we learn how do we take tests how do we show up for class like we need to rethink all of that stuff because none of the old rules are are applicable right now and and they and clearly they never worked mm -hmm. right i think that's the thing that i new <laughs> in my mind but now i feel it in my heart right like it's like this pandemic the the fires the all the you know um social and political issues it clearly shows that they never worked and i think like you know some of the questions that i've or conversations that I've been really um, having with family and friends is like, what do we imagine our fields to look like, right? So like for me in education, I have like even what I thought would be better solutions. I'm like, oh shit, no, it's just another thing, right? Like, I don't know, like what do you all think would be better kind of, like if you could change one thing that, you know, you didn't, like that you're seeing now that's a crack in the system, like what would it be? <laughs> I went to deep, I went to deep, I'm sorry. It's a lot of oh, cracks. I'm oh, you're just digging deep into like my K through 12 trauma <laughs> college. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like one of like the main roots, I feel like it's kind of hard for me to like change something but I feel like one of the roots is just like how like ed um, education like now like not now but like like schools and stuff like institutionalized um, education I guess like how it really doesn't like humanize a student and it doesn't it also doesn't humanize like their teachers as well because like you know I also want to acknowledge that you know as much like shit as I may talk about like teachers or professors like it it also is the fact that like like this whole like capitalist capitalism capitalist system like doesn't like they treat students and like teachers as like like not human like they like teachers are like you know um just seen as like their labor and like students are just seen as like these vessels just to like put information in and then like you know send them off to a career to like be part of this like workforce that's going to produce right we're, you know yeah like we're as much as we are labor we're also the product right? yeah students are a product and then they eventually become the labor as well yeah and like it's just like i was reading parts of like pedagogy of the oppressed by um paulo freire i think that's how you pronounce his name mm -hmm. and he was just like talking about like, yeah, like the, the point of education is to get you to think about like this consciousness, like raise consciousness and like be critical of like the issues in the world. So like, you know, like problem posing education pretty much. And like, that's obviously what we don't, we don't see that shit in, in schools now. Yeah. But, yeah. That's my rant. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of reminded me of, um, I was listening to a podcast and um this it was like it was it's called the read um and they have like listener letters and uh, one of the letters was like from a teacher and she was just talking about how like a bunch of um parents were coming to her like are like complaining like oh you're not teaching like you need to give them homework blah, blah, blah. like my kid isn't learning my kid isn't doing homework I'm like now you see what I have been doing. Like I've been like taking care of your kid for like half the day, five days a week. And now you're seeing how much work I do. Like, no, you can raise your kids. I've been raising your kid for <laughs> a while now. So definitely a newfound appreciation for teachers during this pandemic. Like even my sister who used to be a teacher, she was talking to me about um, having to teach when the pandemic hit, and it's a lot. 
Yeah, I, I watched I watched one class that my five year old nephew had to sit through. Watching a kindergarten teacher conduct a kindergarten class through Zoom was wild. Like I was like I like and and it was a half day too. I think it was like a Friday. And I just after that, I was just like, I can, I can't even, I can't even begin to con- conceive of myself doing that. Like that was wild, being like, oh, kindergarten teacher, here's like twenty to twenty-five five-year-olds you have to entertain through Zoom. Like, go for it. <laughs> wild. At that point, they need to just cancel school. Period. Yeah, I mean, I think you know the my siblings who are um, three of them around nine. You know, they're, they have to log on by, by 8.50, the latest, and 9 o'clock is attendance. And I'm like, why? Like, we don't have to do that, right? And then, um, you know, they have class. I do think that, you know, my twin sisters have the same teacher this year. Usually they don't put twins in the same class, but, like, that rule doesn't apply. Um, and so she uses like the breakout rooms in Zoom and she like, she'll say like, okay, so th- this group of students, y'all have a break, work on this like worksheet and the rest of the students, you're going to meet with me from like 1015 to, to 1030 and we'll go over the worksheet from last week or like from yesterday. And so she's, she's come up with a method to like actually minimize her interaction and then also give her students a break, which I'm like, that's brilliant. It's like these small doses. And I'm like, why can't college students like do this too, right? You have little small, um, she calls it pods. I was listening, uh, like small home pods that you get to meet with and you get to interact with. And it allows the students to then also have some kind of socialization without being overwhelmed with like 30, 30 people on your screen. And then she also, um, takes the time to like say hello as people are signing on and be like, I see you, Zach. I see you when like, I was like, Oh, wow, that's really cute. And then, um, and during their like little break, when they finish their little pods, they come back, they get to do a dance. Like all of them get to like dance where they sit and stuff. I'm like, that's awesome. And I was sitting there like doing emails and I would look over on the couch and like, that's so cute. Right. So I feel like, if a fourth grade teacher is able to like make it work, like why are we in college having to like sit on a Zoom call like for two hours sometimes? Like no one's learning, no one's interacting. Yeah. Well, it's also, there's a scalability issue with that too though. Yeah. Like you're, you're talking about a teacher who's trying to interact with a class of 20 when some of our college classes are a teacher trying to interact with a class of like 200. Yeah. But, and like at that point, like clearly the system, that's what I mean. Like the, the old system of having 200 students in a, in a seminar, like doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have like a hundred students on like in one of my classes and that's crazy. I'm not, I actually don't want to use that word. It's wild. Cause like, I don't even know, how, like, I feel like even 20 students on, like, a Zoom call is, like, too much for me. But, like, in one of my more, like, in my general ed classes, like, there's, like, 100 students. And I feel like that's wild. And, like, obviously, like, hello folks have, like, their cameras turned off, and it's more of, like, a lecture. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah, I don't even know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I remember when I first, like, well, for my middle school, it had, what, I don't even know how many students, like maybe 3,000, 4,000 students in the middle school, and every class had like 60 kids. So when I left that school into high school, when classes had like maybe 20 or like, I remember I had a class with like 12 people. I was like, this is great. Like, attention? I can ask questions? Wait, I'm learning? <laughs> so... Even now, like, I'll have Zoom classes with, like, 40 people. I'm like, nobody's paying attention. Maybe, like, the two people that have their cameras on. But, I mean, I'll try. But, (laughs) Yeah. I think another thing for me is, like, how art is kind of being 
um, used as like this new vehicle. And I'm like, you know, I'm seeing art being used in so many different ways, whether that's like social media or in person. Um, and I think that just needs to be more like part of our daily lives. That's what I would love to see like after COVID or like to, to take away, like it's such an amazing outlet, right? And art can be so many different things. It's not just like paper and pencil or, um, you know, paint and paint brushes, right? It can be dancing. It can be cooking as an art, right? Like there's so many things that I think people are um, kind of engaging in that's artistic and uses different parts of our body and our brain um, that I'm like really excited about that I hope like people walk, like come out of this in a, in a different kind of way of imagining life. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, as, as the resident old person in this call, <laughs> like, when I was in high school, like, I was, I, I used to sketch all the time. Like, that's how I kept, like, active, right? Because, like, I would, I would just zone out in class or fall asleep. Um, <laughs> it happens, all right? Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I remember, like, there, like, like through my the entirety of my high school like all four years like i i use sketchbooks way more than i use notebooks like i would just bring sketchbooks to class and i would just take notes in sketchbooks and then like i would be sketching and then like on the side of a sketch you would see like these random notes for like history class or whatever like it was very obvious like at one point in sophomore year the sketchbook that i was using was like a large sketchbook it was like a like a like a poster size sketchbook so I, I had this like 24 inch like sketchbook that I was using to draw these large scale it was, it was all comic books it was just all superheroes but I was drawing these large scale pictures and then like I would you would see notes like kind of on the side and stuff like looking back on it like it was very it must have been very clear to all of my teachers that like I just really wanted to draw and not study history or whatever and through the entirety of high school i think i can count on one hand the number of teachers that even said anything much less utilize that for anything you know and you know most of those teachers are art teachers so i like i had two art teachers who are like super invested in that part of me but then like i think i had like uh like um my business law teacher at one point made a comment i think he was just mad at me for not paying attention so he made a comment about it um, but yeah, like no, almost none of my teachers, not a single one of my teachers was like, oh, you like drawing or, oh, like you, you like comic books or, oh, whatever. Like, so you were like Olivia. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so were, I miss Olivia. <laughs> yeah. Um, although Olivia is like way more talented and creative than I was. Like I, it was just pencil and paper for me, like yeah. no color or anything, but like, yeah, it was just, it was wild. Like. Yeah, I, my high school, they would give us iPads to like, it was like, I don't know, instead of like books, they give you iPads, you download the book and it was, it was wild. But <laughs> um, me and my friends, like, they should never give us iPads because we would all be like playing games or whatever during class. But like, it was the only way I could pay attention. Like, I downloaded this app, it was like a sandbox app where you like color things, you just like, it's like fill in the number mm. of colors. And I would just like make like, like color like five or ten different like pictures in the class and I'll be like I know exactly what just happened but I would get in trouble if they saw me coloring right now so it's interesting it's like a little podcast I don't know <laughs> I yeah it also oh yeah oh, sorry. So, no go for Erica oh no I was just gonna say how resident they would tell as well like um like, I think, like, during high school, like, I would also, I think still now a little bit, but, like, more in high school, I would, like, doodle a lot on, like, my, my notes. And, like, I feel like the, like, when, like, my doodles kind of helped me more, like, me like, remember what, like, the teacher was talking about in that moment. I'd be like, oh, when I was, like, I was drawing this, like, I remember, like, in my chemistry class, we're talking about this stuff. And, like, yeah. it, I think it just really points to, like, how different folks have, like, different ways of learning. And I would draw all the time in queer arts. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, it also it also reminds me of um, a, a Facebook post somebody made the other day. Uh, they're reposting somebody else's oh, post. But, oh, by Paul. Um, uh, somebody posted on Facebook like um, uh, that that somebody like two two academics had written an article or a book or something, but it was entitled or an, art, an article I think that was entitled "Assign Comic Books as Reading." Like, you know your your students will be more likely to do the reading and then they'll be more likely to be engaged with the reading like if you just want students to read like assign them comic books like they'll do the reading you know yeah my my sisters yesterday facetimed me and it was getting close to bedtime and i was like oh you all have to get ready for bed you have to listen to mom and they're like no we want to read and i was like well, you can't be on FaceTime and read. And they're like, well, what if we read to you? So they each read, like, uh, they have this book called 52 um, Women Who Changed the World or something like that. And it's a kid's book, but it's like this long ass page. And so they each, like, I was like, okay, do you, so if you're going to do this, you have to teach me about two people I don't know. So they always pick people that I wouldn't know and then they read it to me so I'm learning from them and they get to practice their reading and so um yeah I think and then they were like oh we really like doing this so now like that's gonna be probably what we do um at night like before they go to bed that's so wholesome I know (laughs) I love that I feel like that's the relationship like students and teachers should have with each other like the teachers can learn a lot from their students as much as like the students are learning from them too and even just like navigating this whole like zoom the creative university <laughs> like environment it's like they need to listen to us and like we'll help them along the way and like fortunately i have teachers and like professors that are doing that right now because i'm taking more art classes this semester so i'm excited um I did have that one professor that I told y'all about in the beginning who was kind of like not acknowledging um, like the fires situation happening because we, well, I ended up having to evacuate on the first day of school. And this professor was kind of like questioning why like um, classes were canceled, but didn't really see it as an equity issue. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I really like have appreciation for the professors that I have that are like just trying to to understand and like engage with us and like even that professor was like telling everyone to turn on their cameras and just kind of like asking for too much and yeah it makes me grateful for the other professors that are like working with us right now to like have a better relationship with their students yeah you still have that class right now no, I dropped him. <laughs> I dropped that professor. He he had me fed up. He had me so fed up. <laughs> After yeah. that interaction, I was like, nah, dude. And luckily, I got into a class that, like, has a professor that's really encouraging with art. So, yeah. So, I think you uh, said something that, like, oh, sorry, Chris. No, no. And I was like, I just think you, like, you said something that kind of, like, you're like, they need to, they need to hear us or, like, and I was just like, that's so true. Like, I feel like one of the relationships that needs to like happen with like a teacher and a student is like, they need to like observe our needs and then they help like help us navigate those needs. Not necessarily like, you know, here you go, but like, it's like navigating it and like helping us like, you know, get there or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And, like, they don't have to like figure everything out on their own. Like if you're, noticing that your students aren't participating or not turning in stuff like you don't have to like think to yourself like oh well, what am I doing like what needs to happen what needs to happen why don't you ask everybody like why is everybody struggling with doing the homework or well, what's why is everyone struggling with participation let's figure something out you know yeah for sure and and the thing too I wanted to point out about Jazz's story too which is not just because of jazz but like indicative of many many students is that like for professors who are just waiting to hear from their students they're not going to hear from their students like if you like if you have students who are fed up with your class they're not going to come and tell you they're fed up with their class they're just going to drop and like 
So like, it's important for departments, faculty, like deans to be very proactive about the way that like they're, they're conducting themselves in class or the way that their classes are being conducted. Like you can't just be like, well, it's business as usual until someone complains. It's like, that's not going to be helpful. Like you have to, you have to be proactive about like, okay, like what, what are the experiences my students are going through? What can I do? You know? And if you don't know, like Kenny said, if you don't know, ask like students, one of the things I was really impressed by, you know, that was a very revelatory moment watching like my nieces and nephew go through Zoom classes this year is that the students want to learn. Like they're like they they want to be at school. They want to be in class. Like, you know, they might, you know, not be able to sit still for more than half an hour or they might get distracted by something or they might, you know, not like Zoom might not be the best environment for them to learn in. But that doesn't diminish the the desire to be in class, you know? And I think the same is true for our students, too, in college. It's like the students want to have a good class, you know? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the general messaging we often give is, like, for our students to be proactive, right? Figure out your resources. Go to these things. Get involved. And I don't think that should only apply to students, right? Like, as a staff member, I realize that I need to get involved too, right? Like I'm not gonna sit in my office and wait for a student to come around. Like I need to sit around the couches and have students kind of, you know, talk about their day and like humanize myself. And I think that's something that has led to creating relationships, you know, and, and um, making sure that I, you know, invite folks to coffee or, or, or lunch or whatever. And that was, you know, prior, obviously not now, but like, setting up those 30 minute like check-ins with colleagues or faculty or staff, you know, to, to figure out what's going on. How do we work together? How do we, um, you know, communicate, you know, we, we tell our students to do some of that stuff, go to the, the professor's office hours, but you know, I don't think that messaging is, is shared with our, our, our faculty and our teachers and, you know, how do we, I think coming out of this, maybe we should change that, right? Like that's that's maybe another thing that we can change as we come out of um, this period of time. Yeah, I feel like a lot of like the issues that we're seeing like right now with like Zoom University is like, is not just like a problem of Zoom or like online learning. It's like, it's like a problem that's been, like what you were saying, right? Like a problem that's been happening it's just like wasn't acknowledged yeah. Yeah, the pandemic is break like putting everything to the front and like oh these are all problems <laughs> yeah yeah <sighs> it's funny going into this year everyone saying like 2020 vision and you now it's like has a totally different meaning for us That's like we're know. just seeing all of these yeah <laughs> Like, we're just seeing all of these, like, truths for what they are. And, like, this is the product of so many years of, like, mm -hmm. unaddressed, like, problems in the system mm -hmm. and in society. Which, which is 2020 vision, really. Like, we're seeing things clearly for the first time. 2020 said, realize, realize, realize. <laughs> <laughs> he believed. He lied. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's going to be the name of this podcast is Realize. Realize, realize, realize. Yeah. 20. Uh, yeah. I think one of the powerful things in my art classes right now is just like my professors kind of using this time as like a time to reflect and to really like put our experiences into our artwork mm -hmm. kind of going back to like the whole like art aspects um, of the conversation earlier like in the future when we look back at this time we're gonna like be going through these videos and these podcasts and well yeah hopefully like learning something <laughs> like learning something from all of it and like being able to like process in the um 
what am I trying to say? Like process everything, process our healing, process like our trauma and like make something out of it. Cause yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's a powerful thing right now to be able to like still create, even though like all of these things are upon us right now. Like even just like being a student during this time, it's like kind of hard to stay motivated, but like, I know that there's a lot of potential in us and like what we can create, even though we are kind of like trapped in our homes, like everyone's just trying to make the most out of it. Yeah. I think, you know, that's, it's interesting that you're like, you know, the, like, in a lot of ways, I like working from home because I'm able to really feel comfortable, right? Because obviously I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable at home, right? But then there's so many parts that I, like the first month of shelter in place, I couldn't wrap my head around how to do my job. <laughs> um, and so I just kind of dove head first and like, okay, I got to just create podcasts, right? I got to work with the students to make sure that I'm available whenever I'm needed, whether that's like after out, like my office hours are ended or whatever. And I couldn't, I couldn't find that balance, you know? And I think, um, you know, that, that trauma and that, you know, a lot of that, like, started to, to come up. And I was like, oh, shit, I need therapy, you know, and I've been saying I need therapy for the last like 20 years. But like, I started therapy. <laughs> you know? and, and it's, it's led to me figuring out like, um, no matter how much healing, you know, I can do, I think that's not the goal. Right. And I think for me, like 2020 is a reimagining <laughs> of, of, you know, how do I do the things that I need to do that goes beyond like myself. So if there's only one thing that I can work on right now, and that's just myself, like, that's fine. I don't, that also adds to the collective somehow. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, like I, I don't even know what it's going to feel like to like walk around one day and not have to wear a mask. I can't even imagine like opening up the center every morning and like checking in with Chris and sitting on the couch or like just being able to walk to the water cooler and like not have to like sanitize afterwards or before. Like I, I, I can't, I can't I, imagine it. I don't remember what it's like to wake up in the morning and put on pants. <laughs> I all I know is bras are not a thing anymore. Like we're not doing them. I feel that. I also yeah. feel like like from what you were saying, Sharon, like I've just been thinking about like my space too, like making sure like my space at home is comfortable and like acknowledging how like sacred a space to yourself is mm -hmm. and how much your environment affects you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how much how much chaos and turmoil it can cause when your space is not set yeah chris with his leaky wall like <laughs> oh, my oh my god brand new air conditioning system which i mean now it works great but <laughs> very privileged and blessed to have air, working air conditioning but you know, also paid a lot of money for, for that replacement. Like, uh, yeah, ridiculous. So if folks are able to, they should probably watch Bill and Ted 3 as soon as they can. It was great. What? What are you talking about? The Is movie, Bill, Bill and Ted 3. The new one? Yeah. It was really good. I really okay. liked it. Okay, I'm, confession. I haven't watched any of the originals. I've only watched one. And I was like, it's like, uh, it's like stoner comedy almost. <laughs> yeah, I it, saw one. I didn't know there was a second one. There was a second one, um, which was not quite as good as the first one. It's a little bit stoner comedy-ish, but I think it's smarter than a stoner comedy. Um, 
And it's also a little more pure. Like, I think one of the things I really like about Bill and Ted, the characters, is that they're, like, just really good-hearted and good-natured. And, like... They're wholesome. Yeah, they're very wholesome. Like, one of the things I really dislike about stoner comedies, especially modern stoner comedies, is that there's an undercurrent of, like, cruelty. Of, like, people being like, oh, we have to, like, get someone. Or, like, you know, we have to, like, get back at people or whatever. And, like, Bill and Ted don't have that attitude. They're just like, oh, like... We're just trying to exist. Are stoner movies like, like Dude, Where's My Car? Because I've seen that. Like, what is the stoner? What is this category that y'all have introduced me to? <laughs> like Pineapple Express. Yes, I was gonna say that movie exactly. <laughs> that is. I don't know if I've seen that. It's it's really it's really about the people who are in it than it is about. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have Seth Rogen in it. <laughs> Seth Rogen, James Franco. But, you know, Dude, Where's My Car? kind of counts. I mean, Sean William Scott was, like, kind of stoner, stoner comedy material right there. Me and my siblings just, uh, well, I didn't finish it, but they were watching uh, This Is The End, that movie mm-hmm. that came out. That movie is wild. I was like, this is stressful. I don't know what's mm-hmm. going on. There's so much happening. Yeah. And I forget how chaotic um, Seth Rogen movies and James Franco, uh, mm-hmm. so, so chaotic. So yeah, y'all should y'all should watch Bill and Ted's. It's great. It's a great adventure. Wait, did you end up watching Mulan? I I did watch Mulan. Yeah, I watched it okay. with my parents. Okay. Yeah, I I uh, I liked it. I liked it. Did Did anyone else watch Mulan? No. Is it on Disney Plus? Uh, you have to pay money for it. Yeah. <laughs> No worries. Um, it'll be free in December. Um, I thought it was pretty good. It was. It's definitely one of the better live action Disney movies. Like it's better than Beauty and the Beast. It's better than Lion King. Um, probably better than Aladdin too. Oh yeah, we don't. I mean, we watch it for the culture, but like. Okay, I watched Aladdin like a couple months ago, and like. I just didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> I don't know. I like Aladdin. I like I, I like I like Will Smith and I like Naomi Scott. So I'm like I'll I'll watch stuff there. Um, the guy who played Aladdin, he was he was cute. He was funny. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I also am like as much as I love the original Aladdin, the cartoon version, like it's 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 a mishmash of so many different cultures, and I'm like. It's happening, and then I think the the live action they like did a whole dance sequence, and then I'm just like, oh, it's so cringy. It makes me uncomfortable. And and then you know the I do like the song now that I've heard it a couple of times. But speechless, I think is the mm-hmm. is the, the new song. New song. Yeah. Um, but I was like, are y'all trying to rival like Let It Go? Because that's kind of the vibe that I got, and I was like, was this necessary? Um, I believe Speechless was written by um, um, uh, the guys who wrote um, Greatest Showman and uh, La La Land. Um, they also wrote Dear Evan Hansen. So they have a lot of like musical pedigree. Oh, I think I think it's those two: um, Ben uh, Ben Ben Pasek and Gosh. I don't remember their names. It's Pasek and Penge, I think, or something like that. Um, yeah. I mean, reg- I mean, I just thought, I mean, on its own, I think the song is fine. Like, when it comes up on Spotify, I won't skip it. But in the movie, in the context, I was like, I, I didn't need this extra five minutes. <laughs> I thought it was cool that they gave her a little storyline, a little song. Mm-hmm. That was cute. And, yeah, the storyline was fine. Like, her trying to, you know stand up for herself and get through her traumas but, but like I, I didn't need the song I feel like the plot okay so like I feel like the second half of the movie was like like it was there for me like I was like okay this is cool like it's like developing more like different from like the cartoon um or like the original because like the first half of the movie felt very like forced it was like it was like they try to put as much like scenes that people knew about and it just felt like okay here it is here's the scene and then yeah. 
Yes, the first half felt like it was a nostalgic factor. Like almost some of the scenes were kind of like almost the the remake of the cartoon um, scene by scene. And then the second half felt like this is okay. Now this is the new stuff. Like the problematic storyline. We're trying to fix it. <laughs> if that if that's your issue with Aladdin, then I think you would actually like Mulan because they they do not they they don't really worry about the nostalgia thing. They're just like eh. Like they do kind of, they have the, they have the songs, but nobody sings them. They're just in the background. Oh yeah. The remastered version of Reflection. Yeah. That's not in the movie. That's in the credits. Oh. But like, like nobody sings any of the songs. Like you hear the, they're part of the score. So like during the training scenes, you oh, hear the music. It's not a musical. Yeah, it's not a musical. There's no singing whatsoever. Um, so like during the tra- training scene, like the orchestra plays, like we'll make a man out of you. But like, there's nobody sings it. Oh. Yeah. So it's, it, it and and there's no there's no like we're trying to replicate this thing in the movie. I I don't think the anime movie is memorable enough for people to be like I really need that that scene to be in it. Like there's no there's none of that feeling. Mm. Um, I thought it was pretty good. It um it was certainly it was certainly Disney trying to be epic, um like go epic with it. Mm. There's a lot of extras. There are a lot of like 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 the armies are are bigger than you would expect them to be when you watch a movie Mm -hmm. um there's a lot of like wuxia like martial arts so there's a lot of like running across rooftops and that kind of stuff um so you know oh and just a plethora of famous chinese actors they're just like oh who's who's well known in, in like chinese cinema like there's like like jet li it plays the emperor um Zima, who's the dad in like every Chinese thing, like he's the dad in like um uh uh the oh gosh, what was the Aquafina movie? Um uh shoot the uh, farewell, the farewell. Oh, I was like the dad in the farewell. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um The Mom. I remember like watching a trailer, I was like, Oh, I've seen the mom before. Like, yeah. The mom's so famous. The the witch, the person who plays the witch is a famous Chinese actress. Um, Donnie Yen plays the trainer, the general. There's a witch? Yeah, there's a witch. Um, That's what I was thinking. I was like, witch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, the witch is a brand new character. They added a witch character. Oh. Um, and then... Um, Healing to the, to the witch community. <laughs> it's, it's, actually, it's actually an interesting story. I thought it was going to be one thing, and the storyline actually turned out to be something a little bit different, which is, which oh. is interesting. Um, and then the guy who plays Bori Khan is Jason Scott Lee, who played Bruce Lee in, in Dragon. He's it's got a lot of famous Chinese people. I'm like, oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, whenever that ends up on Disney Plus. Whenever that shit is free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That was fun. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I like the live action Aladdin. I mean, I guess I guess maybe I don't have the cultural relations with the culture that they're ripping off but you know I, I, I don't know I'm just a fan of Naomi Scott and I'm like well you know she's been a Power Ranger she's been Jasmine she's Lemonade been a, an angel for Charlie's Angel I'm I like, haven't I'm seen the new Charlie's Angels either um, I thought it was fine I thought it was totally fine I don't know why I don't know why people hate on um, Kristen Stewart <laughs> Kenny yeah, people hate yeah, on Kristen like, Stewart. I'm like, hey. I don't, I don't hate Kristen Stewart. I think she's cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if she's done anything like bad, but she was in Charlie's Angels. You need to let go of Twilight. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get people hating Twilight. I hate Twilight. I get people hating Twilight, but that doesn't mean you should hate Kristen Stewart or Robert Pattinson. We all see those pictures. Oh, go ahead, Sharon. No, no, no. What were you saying? I was just gonna bring up that picture that was going viral, Robert Robert Pattinson, with the beard. No, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen I it. I think. Right, Wait, Is what? that something that's Googleable? Bearded uh, <laughs> Robert Pattinson. <laughs> oh, it auto fills with Robert Redford. That's weird. Okay, bearded Robert Redford. Babe. I just see like fan cams on Twitter. I don't know it's which like video. It's like a picture of him in a suit, I think. 
I don't know which photo is the viral one. This but one? he looks he looks good with a beard. Is this one? It, it was a different one. But like he has like short hair in it and he's wearing like a white like suit and his hair is like dyed a little lighter. But like people were saying people were just making fun of it on Twitter and saying like, Oh, you can find like the same guy in line to get like a hot pickle at a gas station somewhere. People are so mean. I mean, he gives off a vibe. But I don't know. I like Robert Pattinson. He's he's an interesting actor. I'm like yeah, that. I hope he's doing okay. So seriously, like I've seen some of his interviews, and he's always just like, I, there's a, like this story of him by Kenny. So this is what happens at the couches. Eventually, someone has what to class. class. <laughs> they had to go. <laughs> Um, but like there was an interview where he's like, yeah, like I had a stalker once and then she realized how boring I was and then she just stopped stalking me. <laughs> I'm just like, that's so human. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not that I'm downplaying stalking. Don't stalk anyone. That's awful. Yeah. Speaking of when we were just talking about Disney, have y'all seen, okay. um, the Beyonce, the new like the new Beyonce. Mm, mm-hmm. I still have to watch it. I still have oh to watch gosh. it too. Like, what's going on? Yeah, I've only seen like parts of it because like every time I watch it, I always have to do something after. So I'm always like, okay, like I'm gonna pause it here, I'm pause it here. <laughs> but like, it's like beautiful, beautiful visuals. Is and, it like, is it like a visual album or is it like a documentary or? Yeah, it's like it's like a visual album, like kind of like her lemonade one. Mm-hmm. It's like very similar to that, um, but it's just like I don't know. I feel like it's just it's just so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's um, I saw like pictures on Twitter that there's a lot of like black fashion designers and like pieces that she's wearing from them in it, and yeah, all her outfits look super dope. Like from what I've seen so far. So um, I'm going to try and watch it soon while it's still Virgo season. <laughs> Maybe we should do a, a, a podcast commentary on it. That would be cool. That would be crazy. How long is it though? I feel like it's kind of long. Let me I mean, check. We made it through a Miyazaki movie. Yeah. Okay. By the way. By the way, just because this is a going out to YouTube, R.A.P. Chadwick Boseman. Yes. Um, Boseman. Uh, um, sorry, that rang weird in my head. I think I was thinking of Boseman Montana all of a sudden. Um, R.A.P. Chad- Chadwick. Um, uh, if you if you want, this might be a good time to revisit Mosaic's podcast commentary on Black Panther. Um, so that uh, that's a good uh, uh, a good um, uh, audio track to go back to. Yeah, I was sad. I was just like, yeah, yeah. I I remember <laughs> like when I saw the tweet, I like tweeted you all mm-hmm. or or sent you all a message like, is this real? Like, mm-hmm. this can't be real. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause you know, like oftentimes people will play these really mean um, pranks on celebrities, saying that they've died or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm like, that's not funny. Like, why would you do that? And so I thought it was one of those until I went because it was released from his account, and I saw that blue check mark, and I was like, like my heart dropped into my stomach. Um, yeah, I actually I got a text from a friend. Like, I I it didn't I didn't even. I hadn't even seen anything, and and uh, my friend sent me a text like immediately, and was like, "Oh my god, this happened!" I was like, "What?" Yeah. I mean, I, you know, afterwards I've read, you know, um, you know, Angela Bassett and and Michael B. Jordan and and all the different folks who are part of. Black Panther or any of the other phenomenal movies that he's been a part of um, kind of give their perspective and their, you know, their support and their love um, to him and his family. And, you know, I think it's just a reminder of 
um, you know, we're all going to be elders someday. And what is, what do you want to be remembered for? Cause it's, it's, it was just this outpour of like going beyond like the work that he did. Like he did, he had a purpose and, and whether that's because he knew, right. Um, that he had cancer or because that's just who he is. Right. And who, or who he was, you know, I think it's, it just reminded me that like with the time that we have left, right. Whether we know it or not, like, what do we want to leave behind, right? And what do we want to be remembered for? And I think that just, you know, like my partner had to keep checking up on me for that whole week. I was like, are you okay? Because I would just like sit there, like reflect after any time I would read a message from someone about him or see a, a post about him. Um, and like, obviously I'm not black. I'm not part of the community, right? Um, and I could see, you know, uh, students on our campus, college students feel like they saw themselves, you know, when Black Panther came out, um, I saw, you know, um, the Black Male Collective, like they showed up, they went to a screening together, right? To have that um, for, our colleagues, for our students, like there's, that's something that I was like, that's power, right? And that's power that we haven't seen in what, like 400 years <laughs> in the same way. Um, I well, it's a, it's a cultural touch. I wouldn't say that right. we haven't seen in 400 years, but that we only see once in a while. Right. Because I think the same, th I mean, the same thing happened like when Roots came out, the same thing happened, you know, like during these other kind of cultural touchstones where it's like something happened where you're like, Oh, like I can relate to this, you know? Yeah. Um, so th it has happened a couple times before, but it's definitely very rare. Right. But like, I think for me, it's like that celebration piece, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of that touchstone has been seeing the prominent figures or activists, um, artists who have kind of broken ground in some new way. And, and, um, kind of you see the struggle though you still mm. you still feel the struggle mm -hmm. whereas black panther and um Chad, like it, he, he it was all love it was all celebration it was joy in a different way um mm. and you know he i mean obviously so many things came out of it you know that that still reminded us that we still have a long way of going um Mm -hmm. But I think that the celebration and the joy is what really, I think, I saw. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I also not part of the community, but, you know, I, I, I felt something when I saw Black Panther too, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I remember someone asked me when I saw whether I liked it or not, and my response was, Black Panther made me retroactively dislike Doctor Strange more because, <laughs> because Black Panther had like this fantastic like, you know, between the writing and the acting and the directing, you know, between Ryan Coogler and, and, and Chadwick Boseman, um, there was such a deep exploration of Pan-African identity within Black Panther. And it wasn't just a generalized like Africana, you know, it was like specifically from specific cultures that they would be like, okay, we're going to take these masks, we're going to take these patterns, we're going to take this speech, we're going to take, you know, this background and like, you know, make it all make sense. And it was, and you could tell there's so much care and attention put into it. And then I think back to Dr. Strange and I'm like, oh, there was no, there was none of that care in the Asian. Oh, bye. Erica. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll end soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> But there's none of that care put into the Asianness of Doctor Strange, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. We we probably we probably should. <laughs> yeah. So this is what happens. Like I said, eventually folks will have to go to class or yeah. go home. Um, and I I think this does speak to the nature of the couches. <laughs> uh -huh. Um. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Jess? 
Oh, I was just gonna, yeah, I agree, definitely. <laughs> it yeah. felt like that, this first episode. Definitely felt like yeah. that. Yeah. So, thank you everyone for watching us. Hopefully, you know, you could feel a little connected to the mm. conversations that we had. Um, let us know your thoughts in the comments. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Follow us, like, hit the bell. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Smash that bell. <laughs> hit subscribe. Sign Leave up. Leave a five-star comment on swag. Apple. Oh, yeah. Sign up for swag for sure. There'll be a link in the description. Yeah. Um, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so join us next time. We'll try to get this up as soon as we can. Yeah. Bye. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Jazz, for surviving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anytime. Okay. Bye, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye.